Buenas tardes, Barcelona. Hello, everyone. And it's a great honor for me uh, to be the host of this panel. Uh, we're going to do a small round of introduction. And we start with... Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Andrew from Republic Crypto. Uh, we're a vertically integrated crypto investment banking framework specialized in advisory, tokenization, token sales, treasury management, uh, and early stage venture investing. Omer. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Omar Demiral, so I'm a senior partner at Mohabit Capital, as known as um, MC Ventures. So um, Mohabit Capital, in a, in a short word, like in a short sentence, we're, we're incubators and investors in, um, in DeFi as well as GameFi projects, so we, um, we support and, and, and basically help teams grow. Anyway. Hey guys, this is uh, Eric from uh, Injective Labs. So Injective Lab is a core contributor to the Injective Network that focuses on a custom interoperable blockchain on specifically uh, built for DeFi uh, developers. Um, it has an orbit layer, a derivative layer, and so far to date, uh, within three or four months, has processed over $5 billion in uh, volume. And unfortunately, we won't have Grace uh, today from uh, Orca Protocol, which is originally from Solana, but has a lot of synergy with the Avalanche ecosystem, especially on the Avax asset, uh, due to technical reason. Uh, but I invite you guys uh, to check what Orca is doing. It's a very interesting protocol as well. I'm going to be the host and the moderator of this panel. My name is Mark Ziller. I'm the head of developer relations at Aave. Aave is the leading DeFi protocol on Avalanche uh, in terms of TVL. And uh, we have many synergies with other actors of the ecosystem. To start up uh, this panel about the train and the game changing train uh, in DeFi, the first thing I want to say is that the first game changing thing that happened over the course of the past weeks and months is that now we are in what I call the multiverse blockchain ecosystem. So, we used to be in the blockchain with maximalists. You have the Bitcoin guy somewhere, the Ethereum guy somewhere, the Solana, the Avalanche guy somewhere. When you look at the truth, when you look at the volume, the TVL, and the interaction between protocols, that vision is the past because what is leading right now is the synergy. Aave is a protocol that was born and raised on Ethereum. Orca is a protocol, for example, that was born and raised in, Sol in Solana. And here we are on Avalanche building together and having synergy together, would you agree that the, uh, the next step for DeFi is to increase this multi-blockchain world? Yeah, I, th I think that's a clear path here. Um, the tribalism that we see in the L1s and L2s I think is generally problematic, uh, and we're starting to see it fade away. I think DeFi is kind of the tip of the spear that kind of pierces that veil overall. Uh, and driving this interoperability and the idea that these chains can actually work together in a way that's, that's high functioning. Um, I think one of the things that's really important about the industry as a whole is it's, it's community driven, right? Exactly. And so it's not really, if you look at a lot of other, especially like predominantly tech driven industries are very competitive and blockchain itself is more like co-op, cooperative, right? So it's like, uh, uh, you know, merging those two things together. Uh, so you don't have as much walled garden environments either. A lot of it's open source. You know, people are they're encouraged to figure out ways to hack together ways for for these different protocols to work together. And DeFi is kind of the uh, where th that really coalesces, right? Where we see all these different chains are able to communicate and work with each other, and then c just collectively build together. And Eric, what is your vision about uh, those different blockchain? What's your uh, synergy with Avalanche? Yeah, so Injective takes a very chain agnostic stance on the overall ecosystem. Um, it has, first of all, the Peggy Bridge, which allows for Ethereum to Injective, and then later on IBC, and currently Injective is working with um, Axelar on integrating you know, Avalanche, uh, C-Chain, and also a bunch of other chains as well to basically enable this entire primitive uh, to be bridged over and to be interoperable. And that's definitely overall, um, at least uh, in the mid to long term, the stance for the injective community is to be kind of crossing liquidity hub uh, for a variety of DeFi application that's highly optimized and application specific uh, for this uh, any any type of like application purposes or trading purposes. 
Yeah, we are seeing more and more bridges between the avalanche and the Cosmos ecosystem. One big example of that is recently the Encore protocol, which is one of the leader in DeFi that uh, launched an application on avalanche directly. And the link between Cosmos and uh, avalanche is the wormhole bridge. And that's also this bridge that link uh, avalanche and Solana. Uh, that you guys uh, at uh, MC Ventures are also present on, right? Yes, but um, I, I would say that you know if you take a look at, um, at at DeFi and where the infrastructure is going, so I feel like there are um, probably two or three things that are super important. So the first one is definitely the um, the technology that drives the um, that drives all the DApps um, that are launching on, on on the blockchains, and definitely like here on on this um, at this Avalanche Summit. So I believe subnets um, are, are of, of, of great importance so and um, so basically with subnets definitely DeFi also game five projects they will they will have their own you know e economy there they will have their own narrative actually to um, to attract new users even exi existing users from uh, you know from other chains and other you know even other parts of the um, wider ecosystem and um, also the bridges, the communication, like you said, wormhole, as well as you know, stargates, accelerators of this world. So they will play, uh, they will play um, a very crucial role in basically um, facilitating, you know, the next gen of um, next generation of uh, DApps, DeFi protocols that will be launching maybe on a, on a single subnet or on, on, a, on a specific chain. But eventually, for from a user's perspective. You wouldn't want to really know where this is, is this is launch this is uh, this is running on right so you would be you want you know your yields maybe um, and what you really care is the user experience and and all the technology I mean it's, it's not maybe hundred percent there yet but definitely in the few um, coming years we will see a huge um, a huge push in terms of the infrastructure development which will then obviously um, turn into a, a bigger user adoption. I think that's uh, the most crucial point of this conversation we're going to have together uh, today is that today we have around, I don't know all we can count because some people are more active uh, than others. You have like super shadowy uh, yield farmers in DeFi and you have like people that use crypto.com for example. Uh, but how do we build the infrastructure to go from three to 30 million users to two billion users, which is like what we're gonna reach in the next 15 years. There's no discussion about it. Uh, but right now there's no blockchain on itself that can handle two billion users, active users. So how do we get there? What is the solution? So, uh, Avalanche subnet, multi-blockchain world, everything at the same time? I, I mean, this is aggressively being worked on, on multiple chains in all directions uh, you know I, I think obviously I think we've come to a point now where we realize that L2s are going to be really important I don't I think every L1 is going to have some type of L2 framework I don't think you're going to be able to get away from that you're going to want to pull noise off the chain especially as it relates to potentially GameFi or NFTs or, or things that don't don't require like uh, payment finality um, we're keeping it republic. We're keeping a really close eye on zero knowledge, uh, yeah. zk rollups and Starkware, for is, example. Yeah, Starkware, zk links. Um, that is, you know, if you haven't spent time on zk yet, you, I highly recommend it. I think it's going to be reshaping the space aggressively by the end of this year. Um, there's a variety of chains and, and people, speak, even in the Avalanche ecosystem, aggressively working on this. Uh, and I think that's going to be the real answer, is where we can actually pull a lot of the noise off chain. Um, and, and just focus on, on the settlement aspect of it. And, and I think there's a bunch of different methods of approaching this, uh, which is actually super exciting because now we get to see a lot of innovation coming from all directions. I don't know who's going to win it, um, but inevitably I think zero knowledge is, is going to be an area of, of absolute importance to the industry. So you have like two opposing vision right now in DeFi. You have the vertical scaling, so you have those layer one, layer two roll-ups with uh, zero knowledge or optimistic or whatever, and maybe even on top of the seed chain of Avalanche, maybe a layer three uh, some, uh, someday that will be a roll-up on top of a roll-up, very application specific. Uh, some people are working on that, uh, for example, on the Polygon ecosystem. 
and you have another vision that is more horizontal. Everybody has a subnet that communicates with each other. That's a vision that is also very present in the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, I think both will, will uh, uh, prevail because at the end of the day, there's so much potential growth in what we do that there's no need for one solution that, uh, that uh, prevails. What do you think about that, Eric? Yeah, so if you look into like uh, the overall Cosmos ecosystem, it's almost designed in, in a more coordinated ways like that, where the application is, uh, well, the blockchain on top of or integrated with IBC are extremely custom um, and might just share the consensus layer in order to you know enable those like IBC communication between those chains. But you can understand it as kind of this coordination effort of bridges uh, amongst all these you know Cosmos enabled. Uh, or like Cosmos integrated uh, chains uh, that has their own application, that has their own purpose, that has their own you know, special set of community. Um, and you can kind of expand that into the macro environment right now where there's multiple chains with you know, hundreds of thousands of users uh, in each chain and really think about you know, all those like blossoming uh, uh, bridge ecosystems and all the you know, interoperability solutions uh, on top of that. Um, that's almost kind of like a, a macro of uh, how, what Cosmos is trying to build. So I think the overall future right now is you're gonna see uh, you know, Ava connected to Phantom or you know, like Ava connected to Ethereum, obviously. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of you know, really strongly linked um, uh, bridges that doesn't, you know, only support token transfer, but also arbitrary data transfer, you know, atomic calls and so forth, um, and create this entirely seamless experience where users don't feel like they're leaving a certain chain, or um, basically I, I it doesn't that's break a the very important point. I think the end user doesn't care about the network. They just want to do cool stuff on chain. That's a uh, very important. Yeah, because <laughs> all these chains have their own, uh, you know, really unique. Sp uh, uh, kind of like a value proposition or like purpose, right? So there are simply things that you can find on a certain chain. For example, Ava is very, very fast and stable. Um, you probably can't find that, you know, uh, on a lot of other chains compa uh, compared to Ethereum at least. So overall, the future is certainly, you know, like these blockchains are gonna have their own set of communities and users are looking for a specific, uh, you know, use case or uh, application and they can bridge it over uh, between each other like extremely seamlessly uh, to establish this really tightly connected multi-chain world. I think the, the main point that is really important on this thing is on the infrastructure, and we're gonna end uh, that topic uh, with that, is the actual bridge. Because uh, we know that there's been an issue with wormhole recently between Solana and Ethereum. Uh, there's been very recently uh, some issue with Lee Finance, uh, which is like a bridge aggregator uh, between uh, several networks. And you have more and more of these canonical or public good bridge, like between, for example, Ethereum and Polygon or Ethereum and Avalanche, that holds billions of dollars and probably hundreds of billions of dollars in the near future. And what happens if there's an issue there? Uh, recently, Vitalik Buterin from Ethereum uh, raised some concern about that uh, to say that's a potential big infrastructure issue. Do you, you think that is a problem that we will need to solve in the short term or in the mid term? I mean, bridges are essential to the ecosystem, hands down. Actually, one of the best bridges, period, is just Avalanche's ETH bridge. I mean, it's really eloquently done. Um, but there's no arguing that when you introduce a bridge to an L1 or an L2, um, you're adding attack vectors, like an aggressive amount of attack vectors. Wormhole obviously fell victim to that massively. Uh, and I think you're going to see that that's going to be an ongoing problem, right? Now, all that means is we need more aggressive iteration on the development of, of these bridges to attack those problems and to deal with those problems. And uh, fortunately, I think there's a lot of people at this conference that are particularly focused on that. Um, but I think we're still a ways away uh, from getting bridges to where, we, where they really need to be, but we're, we're in the right place to start, right? And because it's so community driven, it's because you're taking two communities and, and literally slamming them together at a you know, rapid pace, uh, you get to double your efforts because everyone is working on it from both sides. So I think you're gonna see a lot of bridge development here in the short term and the long term, especially if we wanna really bring in more institutional involvement for institutions to get comfortable with it from a custodial experience, from an insurance experience. There's a, um, 
there's a risk factor associated with that and be able to calculate that risk from an actuarial accounting level is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, as we move forward on, on bridge development, we'll eventually be able to pull that in and then that's where you get to the hundreds of billions yeah. of assets being locked in a, in a bridge framework. Uh, the next topic I want to uh, talk about with you guys is new project because the project create the trends in DeFi and the innovation. And I want to start by uh, taking the investment uh, twist uh, and focus on this. There's been, since the summer of DeFi of 2020, like thousands and tens of thousands of projects. Some of them were life-changing and uh, ecosystem changing. Some of them were just a fork of a fork of a fork. Or as investors, uh, you can, this, like, or can you have the uh, bandwidth uh, to have the analyst to distinguish like what's going to be great, what's not going to be great. Obviously, you never know uh, for sure in advance. But uh, I want to to have your vision on that, Omer. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I mean, as you said, no one has a crystal ball, so yeah, it's, of uh, course. it's impossible. <laughs> Would be too to, easy. <laughs> it's impossible to, you know, understand. Or most most of times, it's really difficult to assess whether the project is going to be, you know, the project in DeFi and then set, you know, um, set a like a like whether it's going to be, you know, one of the projects that every every other project will eventually follow. So. Um, I mean, we, we've, I mean, you've spoken about the trends, right? Like DeFi 1.0 was yield farming, and mm -hmm. then we had the, um, you know, protocol on to liquidity, and now there's this V-token hype, you know, um, that's that's going on. So basically, I think, you know, most of like the projects that we talk to, they're actually trying to understand or foresee what's going to what's going what's going um, what's coming on mm -hmm. to, to the to DeFi so that they can assess and basically be um, one of the front runners in, uh, in that space so um, I mean when I see a project it's it's it's, defi it's definitely um, difficult in the sense that you know you may be attacking the same problem but how you're solving that could be quite crucial I mean we talked about bridges right there are dozens of bridges that basically does the same, you know, that do the same thing. But, um, you know, if you have a different approach um, to, this, to the problem, obviously you can, um, you know, you can set yourself apart from the, from the rest of the pack. So um, what, I, what I look for is definitely some, um, some you know, innovation so that it's not yet another protocol or fork of a protocol. But it's, um, that said, you know, tokenomics, the community building, uh, and, and all the other, you know, other things that come with the, with the project is, are, are super important. So it's not and that's only something that we see on Avalanche. Like, for example, Trader Joe is not just a Uniswap piece, like a, a fork of a fork of a fork. They have their own twist. Like Platypus is not just another curve because they tweak the tokenomics in a way that the P, PTP token, for the better and the worse, it's not a financial advice panel, uh, can, can be more liquid, more in, and there's like interesting uh, synergy. That's the kind of innovation that's maybe not E0 to 1, because like uh, to me, Platypus did not reinvent the stable swap completely, but the twist is interesting enough to, to make it worth it and to have it is on uh, space in the ecosystem. And when we look at this particular project, for example, it's quite successful and it's uh, still growing. This is the kind of things you are looking into? Sure, I mean, ideally, we, we want all projects to be super innovative. Um, some, are, some are really, like Platypus is a good, is a good example. I mean, their, um, so their tokenomics is good. It's a, I would say it's, an, um, it's an another iteration on top of what Curve did. But also their, um, their model, how to do their swaps, is also quite unique. So that, that's, for example, I mean, as a disclaimer, we're, we're investors in, in them. And um, we, we definitely took that. Um, I mean, for us, it was a really good um, innovation that we really, um, that we were very um, happy about. So, um, so definitely, I mean, if a project is innovative, that's definitely um, a, a big plus for us. And one of the important aspects of DeFi as well, and I think a growing trend is that people realize that more and more synergy are more interesting in our ecosystem than, uh, than competition. To give an example, uh, Aave, which is uh, the main uh, liquidity protocol of Avalanche and also, also other networks, uh, there's another liquidity protocol on Avalanche called Benki. 
and they are here, and uh, we, we have great coffee thanks to them uh, today. And some, someone from Web2 will say, there's competition here, because they do basically the same thing. And yet, when you look at the AVE governance form, BenQ is doing liquid staking on AVAX with the S AVAX token, and there's right now a governance uh, proposal on AVE to use the S AVAX from BenQ into AVE as collateral. So if you have some AVAX, instead of just having that uh, into your wallet and doing nothing, you can provide liquidity on BenQ, use that liquid uh, staking token, so have the yield from staking, plus have the yield from BenQ, and then use that into uh, Aave as collateral to borrow, for example, stablecoin that you will provide liquidity into Platypus. So who's compete with the other one in this? Everybody wins. The user wins because there's new products that can only exist with the synergies. And I think that's one of the main trends. There's more and more stuff that will happen that way. I mean, <laughs> yield farming, query provision, or providing liquidity, Obviously, that's a core concept of what the DeFi marketplace is. Um, that's driving a lot of the interest because there's a lot of financial gains to be had there. Um, you know, but it's also wrought with a lot of issues. It's difficult to use in a lot of in instances because it's still in its infancy. You know, we're big fans of being able to hide the blockchain layer as much as possible. I mean, sometimes you do a DeFi transaction, and if you like trace a transaction that's moving through tokens you've never heard of and environments you've never heard of. Yeah, um, thank God for Yearn, DeFi, <laughs> Adamant, well, all these guys that you click on a button and they do it. Yeah, you know, and you're like, what am I contributing to here? Like, what is like the, what's, what's the greater <laughs> impact of this, this particular movement? But I think the more and more that we can hide the blockchain layer will allow us to onboard more people into the space. Onboarding is really important. It doesn't matter whether it's DeFi or GameFi, whatever it is, it's how do we onboard people more into this Web3 experience um, and, and remove the, the technical component that keeps a very hard barrier to entry, right? Yep. And I think as every, if everyone continues on that mission, and no matter what you're developing, and there's tons of developers in this room, if it always come back to like, how do, how do we drive like retail participation? Um, I think is probably the greater good. Because you'll get institutionals in eventually once you get them comfortable, but the retail component is well, really important. You are doing the transition for me, that's perfect. <laughs> so the last topic we want uh, to, to discuss today is what I just described uh, earlier is like a typical yield farming strategy. There's like five different protocols in, involved, like dozens of transactions. Uh, how do you do DAX on that? Like, <laughs> it's impossible. Like, accountants uh, are more and more depressed <laughs> when, when they, they look at DeFi. And it's only get more and more complex because the ecosystem is getting more mature. We are uh, getting more derivative, for example, in DeFi uh, and this kind of product. And it's getting harder and harder to track. So the first thing is that how do we solve, like, how do we have a framework to know what we owe, what's the fair amount of tax we should pay on this kind of action? How the institution get get in? What is the comf uh, uh, compliance comfort zone? Both for the users, because institutions are users as well, but also for uh, projects. How do you raise money in a compliance com uh, comfort zone way? And that's something that you help to solve. And uh, that's one of the big topics. How do you do compliance friendly DeFi? How do you, while keeping permissionless innovation uh, and all the good things we love into decentralized finance? I mean, eventually, we're going to have to come to the realization that you can't fight regulators. <laughs> like, you know, you need regulators on board. Uh, you know, people don't want to talk about tax frameworks, but you know, that's intrinsically part of, of society, right? So approaching that's also going to be really important. Um, if you look at it from the fundraising side, and obviously that's where Republic spends a lot of our time, um, being able to raise into DeFi frameworks is extremely difficult. You know, a lot of times, DeFi frameworks, our DeFi founders want to be anonymous, right? And that's, raise that's, and invest. Oh, that, and invest. That both oh, yeah. sides have issue on this. It's, it's, it's problematic. Um, when we're, you know, you're talking about diligence, like diligencing DeFi projects is actually really tough because not only do you have to diligence the tech itself, um, if the people are anonymous, that's very problematic, and oftentimes they want to be or somewhat semi-anonymous, it's problematic. Um, Diligencing it on a jurisdictional compliance framework, also very difficult. Uh, so there's a lot of different layers that come up on, on the DeFi side. It doesn't mean it's impossible, it just means that you have to approach it from a different mindset, and approach it with a, a, a really a different thesis. Um, but when it comes to raising capital specifically for these style of projects, um, you know, 
being able to work directly with the founders is really important. So inevitably, you have to shed some layer of that anonymity uh, in order to be able to clear a variety of hurdles, especially from a regulatory standpoint, in order to get it done. I think, like, would you say that is one of the main constraints on the DeFi ecosystem to move from a $200 billion market to most likely several trillion dollars market? The fact that you have this regulation and uncertainty. So it's harder to raise money, it's harder to invest, it's, uh, it's harder to grow on that uncertainty. I mean, it's just an additional risk factor, right? Yeah. So you have to be able to add that in overall to when you're evaluating whether or not you're going to deploy into something like that. Are you comfortable with this additional layer of risk associated with DeFi? Especially jurisdictionally, like where are they jurisdictionally uh, situated? Where it's is really incorporated uh, a DAO? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's one of the, the problems uh, and the challenge uh, we need to solve in the sense that, to me, it's one of the main constraints, but it's also an opportunity. Because at the end of the day, we would all love to have only uh, our own Linux uh, on our computer. We, we do our own router, our own mesh network, so we don't rely like everything decentralized. But the real world is that most people have something else to do uh, 40 hours per week. They have a real job. They have a family. They have friends. They don't have like 15 hours a day to, uh, to dedicate to blockchain and DeFi uh, per day. And I think 98% of the users in the future of DeFi will go through some form of custodian service, some kind of intermediary. We say DeFi is here to kill intermediaries. I don't think so. I think DeFi is here to make them optional because anybody can do their work and go directly to protocol. But services are great. Earlier we said, thank God for Yearn and BeFi because instead of doing 12 transactions, you just deposit in a wallet and that's it. And you think that once we get the regulation, some kind of framework, uh, you will have this kind of service and that's how we grow? Um, yes, definitely. So I think um, from a technology perspective, like subnets, permission subnets, where you can actually decide who, sh who your validators should be or could be or allowed to be, I think that's a, that provides a great framework from a regulatory and, and you know, compliance perspective. Um, and another, another thing is from the, from the DAP perspective, you know, with the um, rise of, I would say, structured products, yep. um, where you, know, you hide all the complexity, so you just deposit and you just, you know, you wanna have, let's say, a fixed, um, a fixed uh, yield, and that is provided by, let's say, um, by a protocol, a structured finance uh, protocol. Um, so that's, that's, that's going to be great, right? Because we would see, you know, banks offering similar products, and suddenly that will actually um, cause the next wave of adoption, right? So basically, you would go to your bank, and it, it won't only offer you like typical stock options and, and, and stocks, but you would be also able to, you know, dip in, um, dip into DeFi and try to, you know, also get maybe a higher yield uh, from that. So, you know, from the technology side, subnets and permission subnets, but also from the application side, um, we, would see, we would definitely need more you know, structured products that help um, with, with the onboarding of, of, let's say, normal users, actually. That's